scientific synthesis project where we're attempting to get at hyperspheric space as an attempted solution to two outstanding paradoxes in science. This will be the unification of space-time geometry with quantum mechanics in order to get a realizable, understandable structure to the universe so that we can explain physical phenomena coherently and consistently. The title of this presentation is Hyperthogonal Chiral Prosody. I purposely composed that rather nonsensical sounding name because this is a massive synthesis. It's actually uh, classifiable as a double extrapolation into synthetic space, an attempt to reach into the cloud with all the information that we have in physics and mathematics to attempt to synthesize a solution which has evaded the greatest minds of man for over a century. Both of these discoveries are attributed at least in part to Albert Einstein. These would be space-time and quantum mechanics, although of course there's a long list of names, not so long with space-time, although you would have to mention both Andrik Lorenz and Hermann Minkowski who were instrumental in supporting Einstein at the basis which was a breakthrough to 4D geometry. So we begin with the information that we do have both about quantum mechanics and space-time but in order to get at the quantum mechanical side of things we have to choose one or the other in order to draw the parallel necessary for the synthesis. You have to understand what it is you do know in order to get at what you don't know because at least for the possibility that what you do know may be misleading you. That does turn out to be the case here. This is a mathematical problem. Now that is daunting to a general listening audience, which would include myself, perhaps even at the top of the list, because I am not particularly mathematically gifted. So it is important to point out that mathematics has a relationship to geometry, which we're going to see in our summarization of space-time so that we can understand it fully together as we proceed on together to solve the logjam whose cause is completely unknown. As safe to say, because we've certainly had enough minds working on it for a long enough time, that if anybody were capable of seeing a solution, that person has not been able to share it in science. So that is my goal here, is to share the solution that I've discovered. Now, a discovery has two phases. To ultra simplify things, a discovery is something that comes to a man. <laughs> a group does not make a discovery, except under rather, ex you'd have to make a case for that. A discovery comes in one mind, and one mind at a time. For instance, when Einstein formulated special relativity and presented it to the scientific world, well, first of all, he had to have a listening audience, and he had enough credentials. He was already well-known and enough that he was taken seriously enough to be heard, and that can be the final step for a discoverer. If you don't have enough credentials, nobody's going to listen to you no matter what you say or how you say it. That is my situation because of the extreme um, extent of time. This is, of course, the modern day. <laughs> we're not talking about a hundred years ago when things were just a little bit less regimented than they are. But now, in order to be heard in science, you have to already be in science. You have to have gone through the mill. And I won't go into that. It involves extremely excruciating um, training 
in high-level convolute mathematics and rather difficult-to-digest uh, theories and models because of the logjam. That's why everything is so confused and also the reason why now the public is greatly interested in the dilemma that's facing science because the public likes nothing more than to see scientists losing their minds because mathematicians are absolutely hated by an ordinary person. Not really the mathematicians, or it shouldn't be the mathematicians, but mathematics is detested instinctively because everyone who has any common sense at, at all knows that mathematics is a dungeon. And you can lose your mind in there. In an attempt to make a living at mathematics, you're risking your sanity. And it, this has a direct bearing on my solution sequence because of the intrinsic nature of the error, the fail point. There had always been a possibility that physics itself had made a mistake somewhere along the line which was generating a sequence of errors, that is a progression of erroneous assumptions based on a mistake in the past that hadn't been caught. That happens all the time. And that's why there was a rage for alternate physics, which hasn't completely gone away. A modified Newtonian dynamics, MOND, was an attempt to change definition of gravity. Uh, that still is being done. It's called quantum gravity. Uh, that is at the top of the list right now. Quantum gravity is the theory of everything. These are synonymous terms now in the evolving terminology of megalomanic, uh, incredibly grandiose virtual claims that there is such a thing as quantum gravity. Well, that's been challenged. And now it's uncertain whether there even is such a unification possible. Uh, there is good reason to doubt that, although it goes against the fundamental principle of science itself, which I adhere to. So my bias going in is, of course, this can be solved. It doesn't make any difference how many geniuses have failed to solve it. It has to be solved or, or physics fails completely. Uh, it doesn't fail on Earth, of course. I'm not ever talking about technology. I'm talking about human understanding, the final goal of science. Well, at least for a human. Unless you think you're serving a machine, this has to do with hum humans, humanity and human individuals. So we're doing this to get understanding for our own lives. Uh, how can that help us? I've already covered that. So let's start in this uh, rather oddly named <laughs> hyperthogonal chiral prosody. Well, we're talking about space-time. And space-time has its limitations, which it's not talking out of school to say you have to understand the limits of the system that you're using. Well, I identified that limit, so let's start out with a bald statement. Um, not anything hypothetical, but just stating things plainly that space-time is 4D. It's a grid. It's a hypergrid, and that would be a correct use of the word hyper. Hyper, generally, when you hear hyper, it means extending 3D cubic space into 4D hypercubic space. And what does the 4 mean beyond 3? One more line which is counterintuitive, which is why Einstein's relativity was not easily accepted because 4D geometry in the early 20th century was brand new. It had just been discovered in the 19th century as a geometry. Um, and the reason why it was so difficult to attain that level only in the 19th century was that even possible. In retrospect, we can say that. Because 3D geometry, by definition, is complete. It's complete 
as a system with a, an axiomatic basis. This is the correct way to say it. I hope I'm not daunting you with fancy words. But we do need precision words in science, and that is the right term. The axiomatic basis of a system in science, in logic, really in mathematics, is the set of definitions that don't have any antecedent. In other words, they're a direct appeal to the universe in some acceptable sense. For instance, the straight line on which all geometry currently is based is not particularly a real thing. It's always strange to use the word real when you're talking about physics because you're trying to match something unreal which is what you're thinking is unreal because it's an image but the goal is to get a match on the system you're using to visualize internally with what actually exists which is of course actual physics the physical universe has a structure so mathematics is the tool now but the relationship between mathematics and geometry is quite a story of convolution. The Greeks only used geometry. They did not use mathematics. The linear number system had not really been developed. Of course the Greeks knew about numbers. But the level of sophistication of mathematics at the time of the Greeks was basically that of counting numbers. Now that's somewhat ironic because the correct system of numbers for spherical space uses only whole numbers. That is, the numbers which are called integers, in this case the positive integers, beginning at 1 and extending to the highest integer. If you have a finite number system, would be, there would be a highest number. So that raises a lot of questions, and of course this goes into the so-called discovery of the real numbers, which is illusory. But all of this we're talking about what began with the line. Now, the difference between the line and other geometric objects is that all other geometric objects are either composed of lines or they're not lines. Their curves. Um, in physical space, we find everything is curved, although there's a footnote having to do with linearity, which does exist, but it's an exception, because obviously there are many more curves than there are straight. In fact, the straight line is most conveniently defined in a hierarchy that begins with curved lines because curved lines are infinitely more numerous. That that's, has to do with set theory and there's some questioning as to uh, how you put sets into sets. But I think it's fairly obvious to just a casual observer who, if you do what Kepler did and several other top-notch mathematician and geometers have done is you draw the straight line and then draw the curves around it on both sides they reflect and the first the first thing that happens when you deviate if you're if you're watching the two ends of the line if you could see into infinity and just going in one direction because it's a reflection but if you're just for instance going up the two ends depart from straightness. Well, that's an infinitesimal change in, you could say one end or the other, but if it's reflective, to get a symmetrical curve. The first family of curves is the hyperbolic family, and those continue until it reaches a, a balance point but then it continues, and if it goes past the balance point, it closes. And you get any 
the family of ellipses. So you can see the curvature. If you watch the curvature, it's going like this, and then it's going more acutely until it reaches a parabola. And a parabola is basically the curved line equivalent of the straight line and curvature because it's a balance between the family of hyperbole and the family of ellipses. Once it passes the parabola, an infinitesimal increase in acuteness closes the line on an ellipse. And the first one would be conceived to be a vertical line because if it's a parabola and now the two endpoints are balanced at infinity, if it settles back, it's going back into the family of hyperbole. But when it reaches the parabola, it's basically diagonal in uh, square infinity. This can be extended to 3D to the paraboloid, which is a parabola of rotation. The hyperbole can be extended into the hyperboloids. And when it reaches the parabola, essentially where the two infinities are going, it's balanced between the vertical and the horizontal. So the parabola is unique. There's not a family of parabolas, although that can be argued. It, for simplicity, I won't argue it. I'll just state it the right way. It's the balance curve. It's a single curve that divides the family of hyperbole from the family of ellipses. But when, when the two endpoints reach the hyperbolic extension and then it becomes the parabola, it then has to collapse together. And that's a variation of the quantum jump, believe it or not. This was very highly studied by men uh, all the way through to Boschkevich, who lived directly following Newton and Leibniz. And he extended the studies of Newton, which also had extended the studies of Kepler, on the families of curves. So they're basically considered to be three families, if you include the parabola as a family, which I don't. So that is the nature of the difference between the straight line and all other lines, which by definition then are curved. Now trigonometry is the basis of science because it's not, linear space cannot compute curvature except to a calculus infinitesimal, which you should understand. It, you, I trust that you understand that. You can't get precision numbers from curvature. You have to use calculus and then you have to throw out an arbitrarily small amount. It's that arbitrary smallness that is the power of calculus. Because if all you need is precision to a certain threshold, which you can adjust, especially if you have supercomputers, you can then pretend that you got an exact solution. And if your machining tools only need a certain threshold of precision called the tolerance and you're within that or well within it you can make your ball bearings smooth enough using calculus and this is the basis of the modern technological revolution leading into the computer age and indeed the space age so without going into any further detail which i've covered in prior lectures that's where the straight line literally fits into things, that it's a special case of a curve. This special case of the curve was fortuitous for humanity that we glommed on to what the universe provided for us. This was blueprinted into us to see a straight line. It's one reason why we have two eyes in the front of our head and not on the sides of our head as certain species of animal on earth have their eyes are on the sides of their head because that gives them a 
wider field of vision, which helps them in what they do. But humans need their eyes in front of their head. In order to compute parallax, it, we have two eyes in order to get a sense of depth. And the reason we can do that is with our two eyes by using our, our eyes will actually go toward each other to see closer and they'll go back out to parallelity to see into the distance to get a parallax, which is a triangle. And that's the basis of linear distance measurement is the straight line that's redundant because we don't really compute curved distance. Now, of course we do, but not naturally. And the Greeks knew that the curves presented uh, quite a problem to them. <laughs> Uh, it, th those problems have not gone away, but it boils down to um, a change in the venue of science itself, which was not foreseen whatsoever by any of the scientific forebears of the modern age of science, could not possibly have perceived clearly that we were going to run into a problem with our linear geometry the reason why linear geometry is so convenient for us and so natural to us that we take it for granted that it's really the only geometry, but a moment's thought will convince you that using straight lines on the surface of the earth which is curved is going to produce a problem, for instance, for map makers, a major problem for map makers was projecting the spherical surface of the earth, which of course is curved, onto a flat map. You get a Mercator projection and a gnomic projection and stereographic projections, just, oh, a major, major topic in geometric mathematics, if you wish to call it that. Geometry and mathematics are strongly related. In fact, in my lifetime, a genius named John Horton Conway was able to prove what had been surmised but had never been proved. What is a number? Now, when you're asking that question, these days you need to be more specific because there are different forms of numbers. And the major alternate form of number, other than the linear number, one, two, three, four, those are linear because they're on a line, there are complex numbers which differ in a couple of senses from linear numbers, but the major one is it's a two-component number. They have two coefficients for two basis numbers, one of which is a pseudo-number, at least from the point of view of <laughs> traditional mathematics. The square root of negative one, of course, is the basis of one of the complex 2D axes. Now that has been labeled imaginary space, which is an interesting label. This has to do with space-time, and to jump to get to the chase, cut to the chase, it's a filmography term, filmography phrase, to cut to the chase, he's get, get to the point try to avoid get to the point in geometry because of the word point. <laughs> but um, linguistics aside, space-time, of course, is an extension of linear geometry. All of science is based on the use of the line because that's our number system. So the linear numbers and the line were proved to be identical by John Horton Conway, but that's really just the tip of an iceberg, so to speak, because the ramifications of what he discovered goes way beyond that simple identity that the line and our number system are identical. This has to do with a severe problem which has never been conquered, which is how to get continuity on the linear number line. We need continuity 
because the nature of a curve is that it's continuous. Um, that requires some explanation, but when in the family of curves, beginning with a hyperbole, going to the parabola, and then closing into an ellipse, which begins as it collapses to a straight line, a vertical line, but then in the continuing motion of the two ends, now the geometry changes and it turns into a, an ellipse that expands until it becomes a circle. And that completes the process. Although that can be extended as well to make the circle turn immediately back into a straight line. And this sounds peculiar, I think, to someone who first hears it. It still sounds peculiar to me, but all the geometers try to address this in some way, including Boschkovich, who had a most interesting interpretation of the relationship of the straight line to the circle geometrically by transformation. When you begin with a horizontal straight line and you move the endpoints up, you're basically moving them along a spherical outer surface, which we know as infinity. <laughs> so the line begins by hitting two polar opposite infinities, but if you start to move it, of course, that's an infinitesimal change, and that really is the quantum jump seen from another angle, is that infinitesimal initial change cannot be defined because the two endpoints are at infinity. So where do you begin to move the points while keeping the center in balance? Well, if you move it a quantum amount, then you have your first hyperbola. And then they keep moving the two endpoints until it reaches the parabola, which is basically when the two endpoints, I believe you could say this, is at a 45 degree angle in square space. And as soon as it goes past that, whatever that transition angle is, it, it closes immediately. And this is the inverse of the infinitesimal jump. Once it gets to the parabola, it makes an integral jump to the vertical line, which is another aspect of the quantum jump. And then from there, the vertical line, now the balance point shifts down to the center and this starts to expand. And that's an infinitesimal motion. When you move the center to make two centers, the definition of an ellipse, you can you actually move them on the line. So the two endpoints of the parabola have collapsed to the to the top of the line. And you could say it's reflected at the bottom. In which case, if you do say that, then the center, it, it jumps from both infinities vertical to the center, and then the two make an infinitesimal motion vertically to, co to continue the transformation, and that creates an infinite ellipse of a quantum semi-diameter, I believe it's called. The, the, or the minor axis. And then it keeps moving the two, it now has two centers instead of one. And these are called the foci of the ellipse. And as they continue to move, am I doing this right? I'm sorry. Yeah, the, the two, the two endpoints jump to the vertical infinities. That's the jump. And now they start moving toward each other, toward the center. And the ellipse, therefore, is expanding from the center until when the two foci of the, ellip the family of ellipses finally meet at the center, you have a circle. And the circle of rotation is the sphere. That is, the, the circle of rotation for the hyperbola makes it into a hyperboloid. And then you have the paraboloid, which is a parabola of rotation, it's called. Well, um, the ellipse collapses. And you have ellipsoids in, th in what's called 3D space. And then when it reaches 
the center and the two foci merge to one center, which is another infinitesimal jump, basically uh, a collision or interpenetration. <laughs> the subject of Ruzhi Yosef Bashkevich's book is on that topic. That those two points meet, and now the ellipse is a perfectly balanced ellipse in two dimensions. That's a circle. And the circle of rotation, that is, what that means is you rotate the circle on that axis, and that generates, as we say, the sphere, which is a rotated circle. So that's the summary of geometry in terms of linearity and curvature. And from that you see that linearity is quite strange. If for one thing it has two aspects, it has horizontal and vertical. We call that orthogonality. <clears throat> and so hyper, 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 let me just take a quick look at what I wrote. Hyperthogonal. What I mean by that is orthogonality, but it's not linear orthogonality. You can see that there's such a thing as circular orthogonality, which has an ortho orthogonality of rotation. That would be spheric orthogonality. And what is that? Well, that's something that's never been discovered until 2022. So this goes to the heart of the discovery that I made in geometry and mathematics, which transforms the linear number system into its integral form. And remarkably, this was also blueprinted by the universe in the same way that the straight line gave us the necessary linear numbers to do everything that we've done in technology and to get into outer space and to probe the limits of the atom going in has all been done to the current threshold of science with straight line numbers, which are quantum numbers. In order for the line to have a metric, there has to be a separation. And this is a separation of two points. The smallest one in a normalized system is the distance, the linear spatial separation between zero and one. The reason for the zero has been discussed so often in my previous lectures. I trust that if you haven't seen those lectures, you can at least accept my statement that zero is a derivative number of the line to the same proportion that the two infinities are the integral of the line. Those two infinities can be operated on with a mathematical operator which gives us the beginning of mathematics and that is called add. Once you have your metric from 0 to 1 you now can extend it. From 0 to 1 is your metric. It's a distance. It's a linear spatial separation and you can simply duplicate it and from 1 to 2 is an equal distance as from 0 to 1. But the distance from 0 to 1 is always there. And so that can be called the quantum jump of linear space because there has to be something in between the 0 and the 1. Uh, no, there does not have to be. That's the quantum paradox. You're saying that there is a linear spatial separation. That makes sense to us. That's the whole basis of the measure of distance, which is linear. So that 0 to 1 is your metric. And you can make it arbitrarily small. That is, to match real space, you could say that 0 to 1 is 1 mile, if you're measuring in miles. Light years, if you're measuring in light years. Angstroms. Well, if you get down to the smallest one known to physics, the smallest linear separation, that's called the Planck length. The Planck length. 
Now, of course, that's an extremely small number. Um, I believe it's 10 to the negative 36th. I could be off by a couple of orders, but that's a lot of zeros. <laughs> so that's a very small length, but it's finite. It has to be, and that's the quantum jump. It's necessary to have linear spatial separation or you don't have numbers. And in the advance of mathematics, it was realized that continuity was needed on the line. And that was the invention of the so-called real numbers, which led to the work of Georg Cantor. And Hilbert capitalized on that, and then everyone capitalized on it ever since, so that the real numbers became, for science, the real numbers. There's a problem with that, and it's the quantum jump. So we've gotten to the heart of the quantum, and I apologize, but I have asthma, and so I'm going to curtail this at 36 minutes. Stay tuned for our continuation into what I have named, see if I can remember, hyperthogonal chiral prosody. Uh, just to leave off with a completion of at least what that term means in the way I formulate, it's a little fanciful, let's face it. But hyperthogonal refers to extended space. It goes to imaginarity, of course. But this imaginary imaginarity is not based on a linear concept of imaginarity. It's based on a spherical concept of imaginarity. And where would the imaginarity be in a spherical space? Well, obviously, the edge. So that's one infinity. And that's the beginning of hyperspace. Now, in spherical space, it can be proved, and I'm the one who proved this, so I know. If you put a, a number to divide f finite, finite space, that is mathematical space, it has to be closed for some operator. This would be multipli multiplication and division, by the way, which is not obviously linear. Linear only has add and subtract if you wish, that's optional, but add subsumes the idea of subtract because on a line you have positive and negative numbers. Well, in spherical space you have a center and an edge, and those are the two poles. They're not polar opposites linearly, they're polar opposites spherically because the two poles of a sphere are the center and the edge. You can see that the difference in size is infinite. That's exactly right. And therefore, if you're going to make a mathematical system that you want to be closed, which we do if we can, and we can now because I discovered how, you call the edge a number, and it's an imaginary number. But in multiplicative space, to balance the space, you don't have the option to add the two infinities to zero. You have to multiply the two infinities. And that multiplies to one. That's called the multiplicative identity. Teach you a better term for that. It's the proportional identity. Because if you say that the edge is spherical infinity, that would be a linear number. That would be a linear infinity because it's implied that that's plus. Now, in spherical space, everything is plus except the center. And here's why. When you have, for instance, a gravitational spherical field, that would have a gravitational center. Well, that's conceived as a geometric point, which is ordinarily conceived as linear zero. But this isn't a linear phenomenon. It's a spherical phenomenon. And so is that number zero? You can prove that it is not. Because of the relationship between the center, which you don't want to call a point, you just want to call it a center. It's a geometric point, but be careful not to confuse that with a linear point. That's a specific geometry, the geometry of the line, which has a point at the center, which is equivalent to all the other points on the line. This point of the sphere is unique. It has no other point associated with it. Does it not? It has another thing associated with it. If you say that the center is a point, 
then the point has a counterpoint, and that would be the edge, which is not a point, which is why it's dangerous to call the center of the sphere a point. And again, here's why mathematically. Since you're now using multiplicative space, which is actually proportional space, a proportion is a fraction. So you should say, to make infinity, spherical infinity, a fraction, well, that's quite easy to do. You make it infinity over 1, because there's a reciprocal to that that makes it multiply to 1. Instead of adding to 0 on the line, it multiplies to 1 on the sphere. Accepting that axiomatically, which is how we began this lecture, the axiomatic basis, we now have two axiomatic bases for constructing space where the zero that goes to two polar infinities is linear space, obviously. And no matter what you extend that to, 2D, 3D, and 4D, that's what you have is a line. And then you make more lines to fill space and then hyperfill it. If you begin with a sphere, you need two numbers that are not plus and minus you need them to have a multiplicative relationship and that's called reciprocity. I think you see where I'm where I got these fancy words from. What about chiralprosity? Why did I invent that word? It has to do with rotation. It's actually called angular momentum. Angular momentum is the measure we conceive it as velocity on a circle. That is called angular momentum. That is not linear. And that's where science lost its way. Is in the 20th century we encountered spherical mathematics. And frequency wavelength relationship is a reciprocal relationship. If the wavelength is one half, the minimum would be one half. Why? Because if you divide the periodicity of a circle, if it begins at 1, click, 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 that's because this is a closed line, not an open line. Click, click, that's angular momentum that's, that's associated with that motion. But it's not a linear motion, it's a repetitive motion on a closed line. And that introduces a new data type that Einstein alerted us to, this goes to time, of course. And so we're now getting at the spherical relationship between space and time. And I have to take a break. We'll be right back uh, with another lecture today in hyperspheric space. Thank you for tuning in. This is Anna Galactic. We'll be right back.